Good morning. All right, as Val just encouraged us, we're going to be in Psalms this morning, but we're going to be a little bit different than we have been. We've spent our whole summer walking our way through one Psalm at a time. Uh, and today, I want to just kind of do a recap, a bit of an overview that takes us from where we were all the way back in, in June when we kind of started into this, and, and we spent the last uh, number of weeks, couple months in the Psalms. But I want us to take some time and just look at what it is that the Lord is doing as he's walking us through the Psalms, and also the foundation that lays for how we see all of life. Because the Psalms are that. They, they are meant to be... Um, all these different people from all these different circumstances coming together, writing about how God is working in their lives and how they are responding to him. And as we walked our way through this summer, all the way through some of these psalms, I'd like us to make sure that as we go into the fall, this is kind of a natural time of transition. So this kind of being the the last real weekend of summer, and, and all of a sudden, if, if college students are already back, but uh, you know, our high school students and younger, they start this week into school. It feels like this shift, right, that happens every year, right around now. And I'd hate for us to spend the summer walking our way through these lessons that God's giving us in many different ways, whether it's through the psalmist writing about trials or writing about celebrations or just reflecting on who God is and what he's done for them. And as we walk that through, I'd hate for us to just transition right into the fall as we get busier and as we maybe we go back into a different sermon series starting next week and, and just kind of leave that behind because one of the things the psalms were meant to be was repetitively sung and remembered by God's people. And as we head into some of what we know the busyness of life is, going into the fall and everything that comes with that, one of the things we need to remember to do as God's people is to repetitively pause and look at what he's done. Be reminded constantly, even, you know, we, we talk about doing this weekly when we gather together and looking at God's word and reminding each other, but you, you need, I'll, I'll speak for myself, but I'll speak for you too. We need to do it way more than once a week. We need to do this daily, if not hourly, spending time remembering who God is so that God's word and his actions and his work in the world and in our lives, it saturates everything we do. You have to work at that, though. That doesn't happen automatically. That's why the Psalms were meant to be sung and repeated and and said to each other at all these different stages and times of life. There were some that were sung at festivals, ones that came around yearly. And as that time of celebration and that feast would come around, the people of God would remind each other as they sang and talked, as they walked towards Jerusalem. There's other ones that were sung when you had times of loss and when things happened that were difficult in life. But God's people were meant to go back to these passages and remind each other of how great a God we serve and how loving and caring he has been in our lives, no matter our circumstances. So as we kind of hit this natural time in the, in the calendar of transition from, from summer and, and, and maybe some f- more flexibility and some fun and some, some travel and some different things like that that you get to do during the summer that kind of moves its way back into the fall, and now we kind of settle into routine, which can come with it, busyness and distraction. My encouragement today would be this, before you kind of mentally and, and, and even physically make this transition into the fall, slow yourself down a little bit and go back to God's word. These Psalms have been, I know for me, they've been very impactful this summer. I, I always feel a little self-conscious about this. I, I get way more out of this than you do, I think, okay? Because I, I, the more time that you spend in God's word, the more he ministers to you. But I want to encourage you to move forward with that. And spend more and more time with him in his word and his promises. So as we talk a little bit about this, today is going to be slightly different. You know that uh, if you're here regularly with us, each week we take a chunk of scripture and we walk our way through it verse by verse. Today I'm going to do a little bit more of an overarching recap of some of the Psalms we've talked about, but also really the main themes that we've been learning about, about God about what God has done for us, about how God is working even now and today, and about what God's called you to as a follower of Christ. So let's jump in. We'll kind of walk our way through. So in the Psalms, we meet all these kinds of people in a variety of circumstances. They're they're crying out to God. They're praising God, sometimes confessing their sins, seeking to worship him 
in a deeper way. And while we walk all through these different pieces in Psalms, I'm confident that the Lord has used at least some of them, if not all of them, to minister to your soul in a particular way because of whether it's something you've already been through, something you are going through, maybe this is a season in life that you're just feeling a deep connection to the Lord, or maybe it's a season in life that you feel like you're in a dry spell or a valley, and the Lord is calling you back and reminding you that rest and recuperation and reviving comes from him. So no matter where we are in these Psalms or where we are in this walk of life that we're in, the journey continues for us to know him in a deeper way. The book of Psalms is and still has been and still is an irreplaceable devotion guide, prayer guide, and hymn book for the people of God. So we entered into this summer series and we remind ourselves each summer when we kind of jump back into this that this is meant to be a place of song, a place of prayer, a place of remembering, a place of of encouragement and even a place of challenge in our walk with the Lord and what he's done. And it has been that way for thousands of years for God's people. All the way back. Last week, Pastor Larry walked us through a psalm that was most likely the majority of it written by Moses. Which means it goes back, we think of David in that time period with the psalms. And some of these psalms and hymns and prayers go way back, even farther than what we think of. So God's people have needed this. God knows how he has created us. He knows how we walk through life. What you're experiencing, what we have gone through in this world, while it may be new or specific to your particular journey in life and with the Lord, it is not new to him. He has known it. He has walked others through it, and he walks with you through it. That's one of the main encouragements as we see throughout the Psalms, no matter which ones we drop ourselves into to look at. I want to remind us of four key themes, and we've seen these, and you can, you can remember back through. Hopefully you've been taking notes or you've got your scripture journal. Some of these themes have been emphasized with particular, specific Psalms that we've touched on. And the first one is that of, and this is a larger word we'll, we'll kind of pull apart, monotheism, okay? This idea that there is one true God, one. And the psalmist, as he walks his way through, and, and in lots of different ways, the different psalmists communicate this to us, but it is a theme that is consistent throughout. It's consistent through all of the psalms. It's consistent through all of scripture. It's also consistent throughout all of history, that there is one God. He is the God that we know, the God of the Bible. Historically, while going by many different names that tried to describe his character to the hearer, we know that this monotheistic God, this one God, Yahweh, as the historic Israelites would call him, is the one that's revealed to us from Scripture, and particularly, it is a main theme through the Psalms. The one true God, the maker of heaven and earth, and the ruler of all things, And one of the themes with his monotheistic message from Psalms is this. He will vindicate his own goodness and justice, and it will be in his time. The character of God, we talk about this often when we approach Scripture. We need to ask ourselves some good questions about what it means to know the God of the Bible. And one of the things God is faithful to consistently reveal to us is who he is. And you've heard me talk about these four key questions that are super helpful when we're coming to a passage, no matter where it is. Who is God? What has he done? Who does that make me to be? And then how do I live in light of it? No matter where you are in God's word, you can take those pieces and apply them just as some helpful application for yourself. But who is God? He has revealed himself to us as the one true God, the maker of heaven and earth, and the ruler of all things. And in the Psalms, you hear this come out in so many different ways. The ways that the the metaphorical and the word pictures point toward creation and weather and storms and sunshine and grassy valleys and towering mountains and God rules over all and he has created all. And all of those things show us pieces about him. 
His handiwork is all around us. So the first theme I wanted to just kind of emphasize and pull us back to is that there is monotheism all through the Psalms. The one true God, the maker of heaven and earth. Secondly, we hear a repetitive theme as we go throughout these Psalms, and you've seen it this Psalm, whether it was this summer, whether we were in Psalm 51 or Psalm 119 or, or some of the shorter Psalms, no matter where we are in the Psalms, you see this concept of creation and fall, okay? And here's why. The majority of the Psalms are a recounting of the story of God that's already happened. And then some of them are also pointing us forward to the story of God that will happen. But these Psalms all have in common that they understand what happened and what's recounted for us in the Pentateuch, the the five books of Moses, particularly right at the beginning in Genesis 1 through 3. Creation of all things and the fall. This theme goes on not just in the world and, and kind of a worldwide perspective, but also in our own stories. We have been created by God. We have been touched and affected by sin and the fall. This is a story that unites all people of all time. The creation, the wonderful creation of God, particularly the creation of you and I. Humankind was built to carry the image of God. There is no other living being that has a soul that will go on forever. Man and woman, made in Genesis 1, as you walk your way through the first three chapters there of Genesis, and you see God intimately cares about his creation. One of the reasons that I believe not only that there's one true God, the creator of all things and the ruler of all things is an important theme throughout the Psalms, but creation and fall is such an important theme because in creation, we see the handiwork of God and his great care for every detail, every detail. And in the fall, we see as a reflection of ourselves where Adam and Eve fell short. And when we think about that, we know that that's where we are as well. It's a theme that doesn't fall on any of us as deaf ears, right? Creation and fall is common to ancient times when the psalmists were writing. It's common to times before that, and it's been common to every time since then. It's common for us. We have been created by God's handiwork. We've been created in his image, and we have fallen short of his glory because of sin. A third theme that we see throughout the Psalms. First, the monotheistic one true God. Second, the creation and fall that that God has made man, humankind, with dignity and purpose. And that all people are sinful and broken, but God's grace can heal them. See, a few weeks ago, we talked about this in Psalm 51, right? David, which... In, in many stories, in, in many storylines, we would have said that David it was irretrievably broken by the time he got to Psalm 51. He had taken another man's wife. He had sent that man to his death. He had lied to people around him about it. But one of the themes that we see with creation and the fall is also Redemption. When David approached the Lord, particularly in Psalm 51, but there's a few different renditions of it throughout the Psalms that we hear David pleading with the Lord for forgiveness. You see this idea that God holds his covenant promises. God always holds to his promises. He has promised that forgiveness is offered. And he will never waver from that. See, David, in a lot of ways, particularly by the time we got to Psalm 51 and we looked at that, David would have been written off by most most of us, probably. But God wants us to know that no matter what and which way we have broken his plans, no matter in which way we have fallen short of his glory, if we come to him contrite, confessing our sins, and asking him for forgiveness... 
1 John 1, 9 that is written much, much later is true, and David knew it was true, and John knew it was true later, that if we confess with our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank Jesus for that. David would have been done without it. He'd have been completely done. We would be done without it. But God shows us this theme. He is the one true God. He has created all things, and while the fall has touched all things, and sin has affected everyone and everything, he is faithful to his promises. That's how, that's how all these guys that were writing the Psalms got through it all. That's how all the people, men and women that were singing these Psalms, made it through life. Because they were looking to God and they knew his character. That he was a God of covenant promises and he never breaks his word. The one true God chose a people for himself and bound himself to them by his promise. This promise expresses God's intention to save people through them to bring light to the world. This is also a constant reminder that we, those who have followed God in faith, that have chosen to receive his free gift of salvation, we are members of what is called the chosen people. We are meant to reflect him to the world around us. So you see how these themes, they all kind of weave together. There's the one true God, the creator of all things, and the ruler of all things. There is the story that we're familiar with and that has affected all of history of creation and fall, but there is redemption that ties those, any of those who believe in Jesus and choose to follow him in faith, ties us all the way back to the New Testament apostles, ties us back to the psalmists and those that are writing, ties us back to Moses and the walk of his life and his deference to God and his confession and faith. It ties us back to all of the ancient saints. It's the same story that we read of that we are walking today. And God's call is that it is a story of faith in your life and in mine and then a story of being sent to all the world. And the last theme, after monotheism, creation and fall, and God's promises, the last one I want to emphasize as we talk our way through Psalms is this idea of, and this is a theological term, we don't toss a bunch of these big ones around all the time, but I'll explain it, eschatology, okay? Eschatology, if you're not familiar, is the study of what's going to happen in the end. And one of the wonderful things you see in the Psalms is this. There were difficult times going on, but the people of God looked forward and knew what was coming. And knowing what's coming held them, secured them to what we know and is defined all through the Psalms, God being our rock and our refuge, our ever-present help in time of need, the one that we run to because we know how the story ends and what he holds for us. So while the, the ideas of eschatology or the, the, the thoughts of the end times can in some ways be confusing because honestly, the Lord reveals to us the pieces he needs us to know and we also cannot fully comprehend the future, those things both being true, sometimes this idea of looking forward to end times or eschatology or the future can be daunting and here's what I want to I help you as you see this in, in Scripture. If you get wrapped up in the finer details that you can in no way completely understand, you will be confused. But if you take one step back from that and you see the God who created all things and the glory that he holds for all those who are in Christ, that will keep you encouraged. It's not a bad thing to, to study into some prophetic pieces and know that there are things we can understand and even kind of you know, use your mind to kind of pull apart and, and understand more about who God is by studying some end times. But the main thing needs to be kept as the main thing. And the main thing is Jesus returns. 
reveals himself to be the king of heaven who sits at the right hand of the Father. And all those who are in Christ go to be with him for eternity. That's the kind of eschatology everybody can buy into. Okay? If you're a follower of Christ, you know what your future holds. And the Psalms remind us of that constantly. The future glory for those that God has redeemed. That's something that should encourage us no matter what we're walking our way through. These four main themes, and there's many other themes in the Psalms. There's so many other things we could unpack. But these four that I wanted to emphasize for us today, hopefully as you look your way back through maybe your notes or maybe the Psalms or maybe you missed some weeks because you're off or vacation or different things. is one of the reasons we do this through the summer is you can go back and each week is kind of self-contained. But go back and listen. Go back and watch. Go back and take notes because these Psalms are meant for you to be studying. This is, as we've talked about earlier, it's always been the prayer book of God's people. It's been the song book of God's people. It's what unites us together when we look at some of these themes, that there is one true living God, the maker and ruler of all things, that there is creation and fall that has affected each and every one of us, but that God's present promises are true. And particularly, that while we don't know what the future always holds, we know who holds the future. And we can follow in faith as he shows us more and more of that as we go. I want to spend a few minutes, you remember at the beginning of this uh, summer, we went to Psalm 1. And in Psalm 1, uh, God, God, I think, sovereignly places that at the beginning of the songbook so that it kind of sets the table for all that we're looking at in the rest. And as I was praying through and thinking, what are the things we need to emphasize and pull back from our whole summer as we go forward? This is one of them. That in Psalm 1, there were three core focuses that set the table for all of God's people looking forward through this songbook, hymn book, and prayer book. And these three are not just true about the Psalms, they are true in general. But in Psalm 1, we're reminded of them, and it's this. First, we must be led by the Word of God. We must be led by the Word of God. Because there are thousands, tens of thousands of other things in life that will seek to lead you, that will seek to influence your emotions, that will seek to help you make decisions, that will want to force you in a particular way. Hear this clearly. None of them can be trusted like the Word of God. Nothing else. We need to be led by the Word of God. And here's why that comes into such importance in our lives because there are often times when your own desires and your own thoughts are in conflict with God's word and the test at that point is this what is more important and what will influence you in a different way your own thoughts and desires your own emotions or God's word and what he has said we have choices to make every single day in light of that every day how we spend our time, how we speak with others, what decisions we make for life, for resources, for the talents God's given you. Do we seek to? One of the themes that I believe is so clearly in contrast to the flesh is the Spirit of God leading you to not only understand his forgiveness, but to forgive others. There's a reason why Jesus spent so much time talking about that. But there's choices that we make every day in life. Are we going to be led by other things or are we going to be led by the word of God? We see it play out in the life of Jesus. Jesus quotes from the book of Psalms often. In Matthew chapter five, he quotes Psalm 37. Later in Matthew chapter five, he quotes Psalm 48. In Matthew chapter six, we see Jesus quoting Psalm 147. And then Psalm 7, right after that. We see him quoting Psalm 27, Psalm 22, Psalm 6. And then in the book of John, in John 15, it's recorded that Jesus quoted Psalm 69. What does that tell us? That tells us that Jesus 
The Son of God who put on flesh and bone and walked this earth as our ultimate example knew the word of God, particularly the Psalms, and quoted them and used them in his own life and in his influence with others regularly. It's not a bad thing, folks, for the people of God to be quoting the word of God to each other. It's an extremely important thing that we do that. Jesus gave us that example, and he used it often. There are over 400 quotations and allusions to the Psalms in the New Testament. 400 of them. See, to know this part of Scripture is vitally important for us as the people of God. To know how to handle ourselves, our emotions, our thoughts, our failures, our wins and our successes, it's important to know how God's called us to to respond to those. So Psalm 1 reminded us, be led by the word of God. Secondly, Psalm 1 reminded us to delight in the word of God. Don't just know the word of God because you begrudgingly should do it and the pastor said so. Okay, that's not a good enough reason. And maybe it's a good reason to start. Okay, just don't stick with that one. You need to know the word of God because in the word of God, the creator and ruler of all things intimately wants to talk to you, wants to be involved in your life, wants to help you process your emotions, wants to carry you when you can't move forward, wants to encourage you when you're running. All those things, it's knowing The Psalms, knowing God's word is knowing the God of the universe and how much he cares for you. And we are meant to delight in him. We're meant to not begrudgingly try to follow God, but because we know his character and because we know his promises and because we know how he changes us, we're meant to delight in him and his word. So not only be led by the word of God, but delight in the word of God. And there are times when we don't delight in the things that we should, right? Wow, anybody with me? You're here, right? You got me? Okay, there are. There are those times. I'm not, I know I'm not the only one, okay? There are times when we know we should delight in something and we just simply don't. Why? Because we're broken people and we're emotional people. And here's what's important. When you're having a hard time delighting in the things that God has given you and shown you to delight in, you need to fight for it. Just because it doesn't come easy doesn't mean you stop doing it. God has revealed himself to us. He has spoken to us. He has chosen to come to us. And he wants to walk with us. So when you wake up in the morning and you don't feel like it, do it anyway. Because it is the best thing that we can possibly do. Spend time with the Lord, spend time in his word, and fight for that joy. Fight to delight in him. Even when your your own emotions and your flesh may betray you in that. Focus on who he is and what he's done. So be led by the word, delight in God's word as you think back through Psalm 1. And the third one is to meditate on his word. And this idea of meditating on God's word is is different than just reading it. When you really meditate on something, it means that you know it really well. It's this concept of thoroughly immersing yourself in something. And when you meditate on the word of God, One of the things that happens is you will begin to see and know things and hear things from the Lord that you would have never otherwise gotten to at first read. At second read and third read, it becomes different. The Lord starts to reveal things to yourself. The, The blinders start to come off and the Holy Spirit starts to open your eyes. So meditating on the Word of God, reading it and then literally this idea of sitting in it, okay? Stopping and spending some time because the God of the universe has chosen to reveal himself to you. Therefore, it's not too much to ask that we stop and spend some time learning and waiting on him. 
Be led by the word, delight in the word, and meditate on the word. These couple themes, whether it's the overarching themes of one true God, the creation and fall, God's promises and the future things to come, or it's the, it's the micro themes like out of Psalm chapter one of being led by the word, delighting in the word, and meditating on the word. These are lessons that we'll spend our whole lives seeking to grow in, seeking to improve on. It's not something that happens overnight, folks. It doesn't even happen in a month or two. It doesn't happen in one summer where we're in the Psalms. It happens continually for all of the time that you're walking with the Lord. The Lord gave guidance through the book of Psalms in the early church. In Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 1, when they were going to choose a new apostle, the Psalms were what they quoted and talked about. The early church used the Psalms as really the foundation of their preaching and teaching. We see this through the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, as Psalm 16 is quoted and really laid forth as the early church is setting the table for what it means to teach the word of God. The Psalms were integral to it. The early church leaders found encouragement in times of persecution. In Acts chapter 4, quoting Psalm 2, to encourage the people of God to continue on and move forward. And keep their eyes fixed on the right things. We see that the people of God, whether it's in Ephesians 5 or Colossians 3 or 1 Corinthians 14, they sang the Psalms as part of their regular worship. They are to be read. They are also to be kind of memorized in our heads. And we don't have a tune for every one of them, but there's some that we do. And we sang some of one as our first song this morning. Bless the Lord, O my soul. That's a psalm. It's helpful and it's, it's very enlightening to view biblical history through the psalms. The psalmist recorded the flood, creation, the flood, the patriarchs, the life of the patriarchs. The life of Joseph is used all throughout the psalms as an encouragement in times of suffering. It talks about the exodus and how the exodus affects, his, affects us. How it affected the psalmist, how it affects us. How God has worked with his people and saved them. Captivity, wandering in the wilderness. These are all things that are mentioned in the psalms because God's people were meant to remember how they have walked with the Lord in the past. Because we're pretty short term on the memory stuff. Okay? We forget very quickly. And as you look through the history of God's people and the story of God interacting with his people... It's this cyclical nature of following the Lord and trusting him and then getting distracted and falling away and the Lord having to come and rescue us, whether that's through correction and maybe captivity for God's people in the past or just some sort of correction in your own life to bring you back to him. And then confession and forgiveness and restoration to relationship. And then it goes again in this time where we're trusting the Lord and walking with him in faith. Okay, this is cyclical. The problem is if we don't remember that God continually saves and redeems and forgives, you can get stuck in one of those ruts for a long time. I, I mean, I've seen people stuck in those ruts for years, decades. But that's not God's intention. His intention is when you hit that rut, you remember him. And when you remember him, you go to him and he pulls you out. These themes through the Psalms are primarily about God and his relationship to his people. How he has called his people to see him clearly and then to take his character and his message to all the world. God is seen as a powerful God. And this is interesting here. If, you're, if you are writing some time, do you want to write down both these? We see in the Psalms God as powerful and as tender-hearted together. Together. Sometimes that's hard for us because you view one of those as God's primary trait. Well, the interesting thing about God is this. He's different than us. He doesn't have a primary trait. He has all of them perfectly all the time. He is equally powerful and just at the same time that he is tender-hearted and loving. And that's pulled out all through the Psalms. He keeps his promises because he is faithful and he loves his people because he is merciful. 
The Psalms also reveal the heart of those who follow him, right? And we see this throughout the writers. They're reflecting on God and then they reflect on themselves and then typically they come back to reflecting on God. That's kind of how these Psalms usually work, this cycle. It reveals the heart of those who follow God, our faith and our doubts. It reveals our victories and our failures, our hopes and our dreams. And it reminds us that the greatest hope we have is the glorious future that God has promised. So, as we think about the Psalms that we've spent time in, as we think about these overarching themes and as God reveals himself to us, there's some encouragements that I want us to kind of wrap up with. Today and, and as we move forward, you'll, you'll see next week we'll be in a four-week series through the, the month of September where we're talking about some major things that the Lord has called us to as a church family. And then, after those four weeks, First week in October, we'll jump back into the kingdom of God study, our walk through Matthew, and we'll be in that for a while. But before we move on to those things, let's write down and think about some big remembrances. The Psalms teach us to seek God with our whole heart. They teach us to tell him the truth and to tell him everything. They teach us to worship him. And this is an interesting theme that that we've touched on as we've gone through some of these Psalms. They teach us to worship him, but they teach us to worship him because of who he is, not just because of what he does for us. Okay? Because if you're only worshiping God for what he does for you, there'll be seasons where you get a little blind and don't see what he's doing for you, and you might stop worshiping him. But the reminder is, worship him for who he is. Not just what he does for you, but who he is. As we do that, as we worship him for who he is, we will learn to accept our trials and turn them into triumphs, which is what we see through Psalms. We'll accept that when we've failed, we can go to him and repent. And we will know and accept that because we repent, God brings his grace and forgiveness to us. These are truths that God shows us consistently through history and through his word, but he shows us right in the Psalms as well. Take everything to him. Go to him when things are going well and when they're not. Repent to him when you have missed the mark and failed. Experience his grace and forgiveness and keep your eyes fixed on the fact that he always keeps his promises and he has told us what the future holds for those who are in him. So, this God, of the Psalms and of the scriptures as a whole, this God is described to us as both transcendent, above and beyond all things, and personal, intimately connected to his creation. He is so far above us It's hard to imagine, yet he is so intimately connected with us that it blows us away. He is God the Most High, and he is also Emmanuel, God with us. Those truths should change how we live. God the Most High is God with us. And as we prepare our hearts, and today is one of the days where we receive communion together, as we think and pray and approach this time, that truth that the transcendent God of the maker of all things and the ruler of the universe, that that most high God sent his son to put on flesh and blood to die for us, to redeem us, and to rise from the dead. Emmanuel, God with us, Those two truths should draw our hearts. They should draw draw us to him. They probably should draw us to confession of whatever it is that you need to work through with the Lord and repent of this morning. Know that you can because his arms are open, waiting for you, and his forgiveness is endless. So as we approach communion, let the Psalms inform us of how we come to the Lord's table. We come in a way where we know the one true God 
has chosen to interact with his creation in a way that we never could have planned, but that he uniquely built. And that through his presence and his forgiveness, you can be forgiven in him and be made new. That's what we celebrate when we come to the Lord's table. And that's the Psalms inform us and call us to it. So as I pray and as our music team comes and leads us, allow your heart to kind of sit in those truths. That the God of the universe calls you by name. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would continue in our midst here now to draw us to yourself in a way that uniquely reminds us of your great love, your overarching transcendent power, and your love and care for those who you have called. Father, as we approach and as we come this morning to the Lord's table, and we ask that you would work on our hearts and draw us once again to repentance and experiencing your grace afresh and anew. We ask that you would show us now. Call us now. Remind us of how good you are, how you have forgiven the saints who have gone before us and how we can bring anything that we have to your feet. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your promises. We thank you that you are our one true rock and refuge, the one who carries us through all of life. And we pray that you would be honored, that you would be glorified, and that you would delight in our worship and in our coming to your table this morning. It's in your precious name that we pray.